Now, there are two great principles I want you to understand that are foundational to the 15. I found at least 15 characteristics of the eagle that should be characteristic of us. And we might look at a few of them today. We'll try to cover them all before next Sunday night. But the two great principles of the eagle, and here they are, are those two principles that we must have a firm grip up. Number one, the eagle has two wings. And in the messages before, I have said that one wing is the wing of prayer, the other is the wing of praise. Praise and prayer are the two wings of the eagle. Now, you read the scriptures and say, Pastor, where do you find that? The Psalms are filled with the struggle of the soul seeking the presence of the Lord. Prayer is seeking. Praise is finding. And what connects the two is the voice of the Heavenly Father. There's no way. This is true in the life of Paul. This is true in the life of Jesus. We shall take some time for that before this series is over. So jot that down. The two wings of the eagle, prayer and praise. These two wings together do much. Over in Revelation 12, it says, The woman who is Israel, who sought to flee from Satan, God carried her away on eagle's wings to a hiding place that was prepared. There are all of us today with so many things going on, the unbelievable uh, evil, the disastrous attacks upon our faith in Jesus Christ. But God has a hiding place for every one of us, and he'll take us there on the wings of an eagle of prayer and praise as we hear his voice. Not only is that true for Israel, when Satan is unleashed from heaven and comes to the earth, it's true of the believer right now. Do you know Christ well enough to let him take you to that place of hiding where you can be renewed on the wings of praise and prayer? And there's a second great principle. Wings are effective only in flight. Wings are effective only in flight. An eagle looks clumsy on the ground. A Christian, a one who knows Jesus Christ, looks foolish chasing the world. That's why there are so few people who believe our gospel about Jesus. They see us as much in love with the world as they are, which will never pay off, and so we look clumsy and inept misdirected. Now, obedience is the flight of the soul. You say, well, pastor, get practical. That's always practical. I shared with our men yesterday in a Bible study. And I guess the thing that upsets me most can appeal to my soul uh, anger quicker than anything else is for someone who calls himself a Christian, speak the childish blabber that Jesus Christ is not practical. The most practical thing a human being on earth can do is to listen to God and do what he says. We've messed it up. We don't really hear the divine message. And the eagle tells us about that. Because obedience is the flight of the soul. You say, well, how can I lift these wings? Your wings won't do any good if you're standing still. And as the eagle must throw himself out into the air and lift the wings to begin to catch the currents. So you and I as believers in Christ must throw ourselves out in obedient and abandoned risk to God and then discover the power of our wings of prayer and praise. You wonder why is it my Christian life working? I'll tell you, there's no obedient risk going on. You're not doing anything that you can't control. There's not a thing going on in your life that you can't explain humanly. And the church that attacks the attention of the world, a man or a woman, a father, a mother, a sister, a friend, an employee, a business leader, the thing that attracts the attentions of others is there's something going on in that church. There's something going on in that man's life. There's something going on in that woman's life, in that youth's life, in that college kid's life. There's something going on that can only be explained in terms of the supernatural. God must be doing it, see. True prayer and praise are only discovered by the risk of obedience. You say, why well, isn't my prayer life any deeper? You're not risking anything. 
Why can't I be filled with praise and enjoy Christ like some of these others? You've not risked. You've not prayed. You've not heard. And that's why. And I call you to that today. Recommit yourself to that, to the soul. In the front of the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, this monument and these words are written. Man's flight through life is sustained by the depth of his knowledge. I have piggybacked on that with this. The Christian's flight through life is sustained by finding through obedient risks the currents of the Holy Spirit. The Christian's flight through life is found through obedient risk on the currents of the Holy Spirit. Now, do you want to be there? Do I want to be there? There are over 30 passages in the Word of God that relate to the eagle. Deuteronomy 32, 11, the Lord said, I, like an eagle, stir up the nest. And I, carry, I gather you on my wings. I catch you on my wings. In Proverbs 30, 19, where the writer Solomon says that there are four thing, three things that are a mystery of, unto me, four I cannot fathom. One of them is the way of an eagle in the air, which literally means the personal victory we have in life through God's Spirit. In Isaiah 40, 31, the third one we're looking at right now, I will mount up. Notice the Scriptures make it very clear that the eagle doesn't flap up. The eagle, because he builds his nest high, his vision is in the heights, all he has to do if he's thinking of God is to throw himself out in obedience and the wings mount up. He doesn't have to flap. What's wrong in so many churches, they, they struggle in the soul. In fact, there are three kinds of churches. There are the churches involved in soul struggle, their mind and will and emotion and their reason and their thinking. They're trying to move the church of God forward. The second type of church raises the arm of the flesh. They have the PR. They have the money. They have the personalities. They have the program. And boy, we're going to do something for God whether he wants it done or not. And then there's that third church that is so controlled and filled with men and women and young people who are listening to the voice that they have mounted in the heavenlies. They see only Christ and he tells them what to do and they throw themselves out into the currents of God's will and soar on the wings of prayer and praise. We don't flap up. We mount up. The currents carry us. And then Psalm 103. Oh, what a psalm. Look at that with me a moment. Keep one finger in Isaiah 40, but here we see a tremendous description of the eagle. In Psalm 103, perhaps something you haven't seen before, one of the great psalms of David Notice it begins with three praises. It ends with four praises. The perfect number of seven. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. When is David doing this? In prayer. In prayer, suddenly he catches a vision of praise, which I'll share with you in a moment. Forget not all his benefits. Now, I'm trying to study the text here in the Hebrew, Pastor Brown, to determine whether forget not all his benefits is one of the things for which David praises God, or it's a prelude to the other things that God gives him, four things. So I'm working on this. And yet the thought is there, no matter how much I work on it, if I can hit at this and get 80% of it, that's better than the 40% I've had before. But you look at the Word of God and it breaks down in unbelievable practicality. Now, David goes to the Father in prayer. Oh, Lord, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. Help me not forget the benefits. Now, here's what the benefits are. One, he forgives all of our sins. Two, he heals all of your diseases. Three, he redeems your life from the pit. He brings you back from depression and despair and hurt and wounds and battles and tragedy. He keeps bringing you back. Every one of us here has been brought back again and again and again and again. 
Oh, we know the meaning of that redemption, don't we? He never ceases reaching for us. He crowns you with love and compassion. Oh, the wonder of maturity and growing older and to see the things that really matter. Oh, we'll exchange a hundred years if it helps us know the Lord better. I went back and reread this week and studied a little more deeply in the life of Abraham based on the phrase I even preached to you and myself last week that your greatest moments with God can come at any age. This crazy world we live in, live in, say, oh, it's a youth world. Better do it quick. You're running out of time. Go around. You only go around once. Get all the gusto you can get and all that stuff and what current phrases they have now. You older people know how every generation comes up with their own words. They're in and you're out, but it's the same old babble. Doesn't mean anything any different. But if we love people and want to communicate, we'll adopt their words and let them know we understand them at their baby level. But oh, crowns you with love and compassion. How much he's done for us. As I looked at Abraham's life, 75 years before God told him he'd be a father. That's a long time to wait. 25 years before Isaac was born. 10 to 15 years when he offered him up. And Sarah died. 10 years later, Sarah died at 127. Abraham was 137. He died at 175. Translate that into our year of time. Listen, friends, the most tragic thing on earth is for a man or a woman to grow old and not grow deeper in the wonder of the God that made them. No more pitiful sight comes to my mind than an old person who has still not discovered the exciting presence of the living God. Don't let it happen to you. And the way it begins is by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. I say often, I hope everyone in here has a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't, if you want to make it sure, talk to one of our pastors. But let me go beyond that. Or someone you know, or your Sunday school teacher, or one of our deacons, or one of our elders, they can tell you how to receive Christ. But let me tell you again. Tell him, oh, Father, my life is bankrupt. I need to be redeemed. There's a, there's a dullness. There's a monotony. There's an emptiness. There's a fear about my life. How can I handle it? I want you in my life. So as best as I know, I come to you now. I offer this weak vessel, this little mind. And, and I ask you to come into my heart and save me from what I am. Make me what you created me to be. I receive you, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord. Whatever that means, I don't understand it, but I want you. Come in, change me, help me follow you the rest of my life. You put that in any words you can, and I promise God will understand it. And His perfect Holy Spirit will be in you, bang, forever. You have a perfect nature given from God that the soul has to struggle to understand. I've finally come to a conclusion, and I'm sure they will ask me to speak somewhere, the International Council of Theologians or something, but why we've had the problem with Calvinism and Arminianism all these years. You know, Calvinism says God does it all, the sovereignty of God, you don't even have to decide. He's already picked who's going to be saved. Arminianism says that we got to work it out. It all depends on you. You can be saved, but if you blow it, you can do it and go to hell. Well, see, Calvinism literally is talking about the perfect nature of God that's been put into us when we receive Jesus Christ. The perfect nature of Christ comes into us. The Bible says nothing about human nature. There is no such thing as human nature. A human being has a capacity for only two things. We have a capacity for the sin nature, for the satanic nature, or we have a capacity for the Christ nature or the divine nature. That's our choice. Once we have chosen the new divine nature to come into us, we are perfect for eternity, and we base our life on that. That's Calvinism. Arminianism says the soul has to work it out. Our mind and will and emotion is all messed up. We have habits. We have traditions. We have blindness that we have to work out. That's why Paul told the Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so we discover these things. Oh, Oh, boy, I, I messed that point up. How many hours did I spend on that? He crowns you with love and compassion. Thank God for the years, for the months, for the days. Look at the next one. Who satisfies your desires with good things. Satisfies your desires. 
He even purifies our desires. So, so there it is, see, mounting up with wings of the eagle is not one of the blessings. What happens is, once you remember God's blessing, knowing how He forgives, knowing how He heals, knowing how He redeems, knowing how He crowns, knowing how He satisfies, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. Listen, a man or woman who's known God's forgiveness and His healing and His redemption and His compassion and His love and His satisfaction can't help but be a man or a woman filled with the wings of prayer and praise. See, that's what it's all about. Beautiful, is it not? And then in Exodus 19, 4, the Lord said, I carried you on eagle's wing and brought you to myself. That's the whole point of the Christian life. I carried you on eagle's wings if you and your soul understand the wing of prayer, the wing of praise, and how to hear my voice, I will carry you. And the point of it is, I will carry you to myself. And that's where we've so often missed it. There's one thing and one thing alone the Lord Jesus Christ desires from every one of us. What is it? It's our fellowship. Oh, what a thought. It's our presence. It's our heart. It's our honesty. It's our minds. It's our worship. Why do we have children? I ask you that. Why did you have your kids? To help around the house? <laughs> huh? Why do you think Christ had you to work in the church? No, sir. To love you and to know you, and to bring you to himself, you see. That's the message of the Christ life. That's the point of the eagle. Now, in this reordered moment, I want to talk about praise for just a few minutes. Because out of prayer, which sometimes is lingering and long, and as the eagle does all these things, which I shall print up for you, we begin to see how God works in our lives. The eagle builds his nest in the air, see? He, high, he sees the heavenlies. That's where he starts. Tonight, I'm going to uh, draw for you two, I think, wonderful illustrations, graphics here, of what the Christian life is all about, how the Spirit lifts us, and how the process of lift, spiritual lift, really works. And I've shared with you that when I went through flight school, I learned Brunelli's principle, but I need to repeat it again for some of you, where as a wing moves through the air, the top has camber in it. It's, it's a curve. The bottom is flat. And I discovered to my amazement that an airplane flies not by being lifted from the bottom, but by the lack of pressure from the top. And what did Adam and Eve have pulled on them in the Garden of Eden? Satan lied to them about the top. You can't trust God. He's really not going to give you all you want. You better take it into your own hands. You'd better get down here and start manipulating and start planning and start controlling and start organizing and start working if you're going to really have what God doesn't want you to have. And therefore, they became more abound in a lie. When the truth about God lifts the pressure from above and, ooh, we begin to soar, see? Because it's the lack of pressure over the top of the wing, not the pressure under the wing that presides lift. If the airplane's moving, no airplane on earth is going to fly if it just sits there in the runway. It has to move. And movement for the Christian is risking obedience to Jesus Christ. Some of you say, oh, I'm obedient. Yeah, but you're passively obedient. It's a defensive thing. You're just sitting, well, I'm not going to do anything wrong. You're never going to know Jesus Christ if that's all your objects are. I'm not going to do anything wrong. He says, risk what's right. Then you can begin to soar and to fly with me. I tell you, it'll come back to you. I prayed about this. I, I hope that I have uh, two or three things. I'm going to share just three of them with you. A letter from one of our former students, a paratrooper, the Army, overseas, 15 years ago, served on staff. You came to my heart today while reading the Word. Now, boy, that's a wonderful way to begin a letter, isn't it? He's in Haiti. 
For whatever reason, some of us did not grasp the opportunity granted to us while we were at UBC. Yet you may never know how much the church and you have impacted us and many others. I want to thank you for that. You ever gotten a letter like that? I'm sure you have. And then he puts down here, the purpose is the letter is to thank you and all of you and acknowledge the godly influence that you and the church made in my life and to so many. I fear too many of us forget it. Yet I truly believe in the heart that so many of us have a birth certificate stamp born at UBC. Isn't that beautiful? I just stopped and looked at that and I, oh Lord, man, you know our weakness and our, oh. Isn't it amaze you that God can take every one of us in here? We're not worth hardly anything, are we? Except to Him. And yet when someone comes up to you and says, God, bless me through you, I don't think there's a more thrilling thing on earth than that. I took uh, Pastor Vaughn with me this week and we went to see Miss Vera. Might as well tell you who it is. She's 87, I believe it is. And I uh, said uh, she had broken her leg. And she said, well, I just praise the Lord. She says, I broke my bad leg. She said, when I was a girl, she remembers, she was eight years old going out to the outhouse years ago and there had been an ice storm and she slipped. Broke her leg, broke her left leg. Bone went through it. And she broke it again, that same leg. She says, where did I? I wrote it down. It was so good. Well, I just, uh, praise the Lord, I broke, uh, here, well, I broke my leg. I praise God I broke my bad one again rather than the good one or I'd have two bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat there and I said, this is the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you how this prayer and praise thing works. That's why quiet time is so important. We're going to talk about the great payoff of prayer. As this past week, I was praying, or it was maybe two weeks ago, and I was just asking the Lord. I didn't even know what to ask him. I said, Lord, help me. And suddenly, out of my prayer, he gave this thought. For the true followers of the Master, they find no problems on earth, only promises. I said, boy, that's a great thought. You mean I have no problems on earth? No, you don't. You're not there to find problems. You're there to find promises. Every problem is prelude to my promise. And then I said, well, how does that work? I always want to be practical. I said, how does that work out? And then I began to write things down. It just came to me. What, five little things? Well, six, just bang, bang, bang. Sometimes the Lord speaks to you like that, doesn't he? Sometimes you write them down, sometimes you don't. One time I wanted to write something down. The Lord said, wait a minute, you don't need to write that down. I said, but I'll forget it and can't use it. And he said, who gave it to you? I said, well, you did. If I want you to use it, I'll give it to you again. Because a lot of us write notes and make an idol out of our notes. I don't know. I just throw myself at his feet. Lord, help me be what you want me to be. But I jotted this down. There are no problems, only promises. The employee... I'm not appreciated by my boss. Then learn how little you really appreciate Christ. There's nothing better than a lesson in being unappreciated to help you appreciate how much you don't appreciate Jesus. Thank you. Lord, I don't want you to feel that way about me. Here's a wife. My marriage is not happy. Well, earth creates longings that only heaven can fulfill. You ever thought of that? It just came to me. H, there's some longings created in your heart on earth that will never be fulfilled until you're in heaven. Here's a widow. I have lost my greatest love. Well, all losses here tell you to seek gains there. Every loss here is a part of to seek gains there. Besides, husbands, wives, now I want to be tender. I've not lost my mate. Some of you have. Remember, your greatest love is not the husband or wife you've lost. Your greatest love. And sometimes losing our greatest earthly love is the best lesson on how he should have all along been our greatest love. I'm not taking away the grief, the hurt, the loss, or anything else. But he's always above any man. Here's another one. Here's the parent. My precious child did not survive this illness. And then I was blessed with this. Everything in God's will survives. You just have to wait to see it. 
There's no child lost on death by anyone who doesn't survive. Humiliation. I've been humiliated. Well, I have not been treated fairly. Well, by man, perhaps, but by Christ, you'll always be treated fairly. Which is more important? In fact, man's betrayal just helps us see Christ's loyalty is more magnificent. And the reason we praise, and I, this little paper, I don't know, I forget it, never use it again, but how that fed into my soul, and I jotted down here the sum of it. You may want to fill it in, have better illustrations than I. The Lord Jesus, even in the midst of suffering, pain, and, and rejection, never had any doubt that his obedience would ultimately create the Father's perfection. He lived triumphantly with this conviction. And that's the way we should live. Your obedience to God, my obedience to God, regardless of what it looks like here, will ultimately create the Father's perfection in you. And that's why you and I can live in this triumphant conviction. Throw yourself out. Let me throw myself out. Let us throw this church out. From the high perspective of, oh, only what Christ wants us to do into the currents of his Holy Spirit. And I tell you, our lives will be changed forever and immediately by the wings of prayer and praise.